Right, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Larry, for very kind uh, introduction. Um, yes, uh, as you can see, this book is I mean, it, uh, it's a book with uh, probably the weirdest title and definitely the strangest cover for an economics book in history. Don't ask me about the cover. It's all the publisher's doing, so ask Will. <laughs> My editor over there, I, I have uh, nothing to say about that. <laughs> well, as for the title, you may say that, uh, well, one may like or dislike capitalism, but is there really anything more to know about it? I say that, that there are lots of things that you thought you knew about capitalism. Uh, at best, uh, partial truth and at worst, downright myth. So you actually need to know a lot of things about capitalism in order to understand how it really works and how it can be made better. Okay, so that's uh, the easy part about the title, but then why 23 things? Well, some people thought that I was uh, a fan of Michael Jordan, the legendary American base, uh, basketball player whose uh, back number is apparently 23. I don't watch basketball. Some people thought that this is uh, based on some strange uh, numerology where all the world's uh, significant events are related to the number 23, apparently that uh, set out in this uh, book, uh, uh, novel, uh, series of novels that are called Illuminatus. I've never heard of that. Well, essentially, it's a random number. The working title was actually 20 things they don't tell you about capitalism. But uh, one day, I was uh, talking to my literary agent, uh, Ivan Mulcahy, who um, unfortunately cannot be here today. I, I still remember the conversation that, that we were sitting in the patisserie pole in Paddington Station, having our coffee, and then that, that we were talking about the title, and at one point, we looked at each other and said, 20 things is a bit boring, isn't it? So I said, yeah, that, that's true. I could easily write about a dozen more things, but that would make the book too long, so why not start at 25? Well, 25 is a bit obvious. I don't like even numbers. 21, well, too close to 20, so why not 23, huh? So the title was born. Well, it's a bit uh, Monty Python-esque, but uh, that, in a way, kind of sums up uh, the spirit with which uh, the book was uh, written. My American publisher, Bloomsbury, describes it as a light-hearted book with a serious purpose. So the, that's, uh, 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 this title, while quite random, but actually has, yeah some, some uh, meaning to it. Now, you'll find many of uh, the things in the book uh, difficult to swallow, maybe not necessarily all 23 of them for all of you, but a sufficient number of them to make most of you uncomfortable. For example, yes, uh, these are thing one and thing two from Dr. Seuss, Cat in the Hat. So thing one says there's no such thing as a free market. You know, this you might uh, uh, think is uh, really strange because, yes, uh, you may or may not like a free market, but, you know, one, uh, when you see it. Yeah? But uh, is that really the case? You know, for example, in the 19th century, when the, the social reformers uh, tried to r bring uh, legislation to the British Parliament uh, regulating and partly banning child labor, there's a huge uproar amongst uh, free market uh, supporters. Yeah? And, and believe me, this regulation was incredibly kind of uh, primitive. So they banned factory work 
for children up to the age of nine. Between 10 and 16, children could work, but only up to 12 hours a day. Yes, I mean, they are really going soft on these kids, huh? <laughs> and uh, this was applied only to cotton factories, which was uh, considered uh, particularly harmful for the workers' uh, health. Yeah? Even then, free market supporters said, uh, no, this is uh, th th absolutely outrageous. This is undermining the sanctity of uh, the, the, the idea of freedom of contract, which is the foundation of a uh, of free market. You know, these children want to work. These people want to employ them. What is the problem? Yeah? You know, today, even the most ardent supporters of free market would not endorse this kind of idea. Yeah? And this example actually quite uh, powerfully illustrates that uh, like beauty, freedom of the market is in the eyes of the beholder. Huh? So if you believe that uh, children should have a childhood, have education, shouldn't have to work, yeah, then of course that, uh, you will think uh, nothing of uh, having regulation on child labor. If you didn't believe that, like uh, those uh, 19th century British uh, free market supporters or many capitalists in uh, developing countries today, you say that, actually trying to regulate child labor is an infringement on the workings of a uh, free market. Huh? So actually, that, the very definition of uh, free market is political. Yeah? You know, free market economists like to tell you that you know, politics uh, should be kept away from economics because uh, it will keep interfering with the market rationality. Yeah? It will make it inefficient. But actually, the very definition of uh, the boundaries of the market, you know, who can participate, what can be sold and bought, how they can be sold and bought, these are all politically determined. Huh? So when the free market economists say that, that uh, we are scientists and those uh, the people who want to intervene in the market are politically minded uh, uh, kind of uh, people, they are actually that, that are not telling you the truth. You know? The truth is that free market position is as political as any other position. Thing two says uh, companies should not be run in the interest of the owners. Once again, a quite weird proposition on the face of it. Well, I say this uh, because uh, these days companies are owned by floating shareholders who do not really have any commitment in the long-term future of the companies. Huh? So they demand the maximum amount of uh, short-term profit and the maximum proportion of uh, that to be distributed uh, as uh, dividends. You know, some American economists uh, did this uh, calculation and uh, argued that if General Motors didn't engage in this uh, famous uh, share buyback, namely the companies buying their own shares uh, to prop up uh, share prices to please the shareholders, it could have actually paid off uh, the, all the debts uh, the, that uh, made it uh, go bankrupt uh, back in 2008. Yeah? Anyway, so the, these uh, the floating shareholders uh, demand uh, short-term profit, highest possible rate of uh, dividends, and of course uh, the, this uh, harms the long-term future of the company because it, uh, the easiest way for companies to make uh, profit is not to invest. Yeah? especially in the, the things that uh, have long-term returns like machinery and research and development, worker training. Yeah? But uh, do they care? No, the owners, so-called owners, uh, do not really care because uh, they can always uh, the, go to another company if the company goes into decline. Yeah? So actually, that, uh, running the company in the interest of uh, the legal owners is not actually good for the company itself. Yeah? Anyway, that, that basically, that, that I have 23 of uh, these kind of things, uh, things that sound quite absurd or counterintuitive at least, and that, but that if you read it through, you will realize that actually you know, there's some uh, important argument there. Uh, just uh, another example. Yes, uh, I, mean, uh, I don't think I have time to go through it, but basically in this example I'm say, uh, asking you are told all the time that markets reward people justly, so 
whatever happens in the market is uh, the, not only efficient but uh, fair. But is that really true? You know, for example, in this uh, thing, I talk about uh, two bus drivers, one uh, Indian guy called Ram, well, he's a fictional character, but that, uh, who's uh, driving a bus in New Delhi. Another guy called Sven, who drives a bus in uh, Stockholm. Sven gets uh, paid 50 times what Ram gets paid. Hmm? But is it because uh, that Sven is, uh, of, is uh, 50 times better at driving than Ram is? Well, I don't know whether we can... <laughs> actually the measure the quality of driving in that kind of way, but even if you can, the, is it really true? And I argue that if anything, Ram will be a skill, more skilled driver because the Ram has to drive on a road like this, <laughs> whereas uh, the, what the, the Sven faces is this. Yeah? You know, basically, Sven can the, 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 the get paid as far as he knows uh, how to drive straight, yeah? whereas Ram has to dodge the car, dodge the rickshaw, yeah, dodge the, 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 the bicycles uh, stack three meters high with the crates, you name it. Yeah? And then yeah, I explained that this is uh, mainly about uh, immigration control and so on. I wouldn't yeah, tell you more. I mean, it, uh, you have to read this. That, um, I'm not going to that, uh, give you yeah, all the preview. <laughs> so uh, there are more things. So, thing 19 says, uh, despite the fall of communism, we are still living in planned economies. Yes, uh, we are. Thing 4, the washing machine has changed the world more than the internet has. Thing 13, making rich people richer doesn't make the rest of the richer. Yes, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the slogan during the Thatcher and New Labour period was that we first have to make you know, rich people stinking rich, you know, so that, that, that some money will uh, flow down. You know? Actually, this hasn't happened. You know? And there are good reasons, and I explained the reasons in this uh, thing. You know? Thing 22, financial markets need to become less, not more efficient. Thing 20, equality of opportunity may not be fair. Yeah, I that, uh, recently uh, had an article in The Guardian uh, a couple of days ago uh, on this issue. So if you're interested, uh, you can read that. Thing 16, we are not smart enough to leave things to the market. Huh? Thing 23, good economic policies does not require good economists. Yeah, that, that'll make me very popular among my colleagues, but... I'm already beyond the pale, so I don't really care. <laughs> and thing 15, people in poor countries are actually more entrepreneurial than people in rich countries. Huh? You know, uh, typically we say, ah, oh, uh, people in poor countries, they are lazy, they are not enterprising, that's why they are poor. No, actually, yeah, the reality is the, the opposite. Anyway, I uh, cannot go into the details uh, today. Oh, sorry, uh, that's uh, for later. When I say these things, uh, some of you may think that I'm anti-capitalist. That would be actually wrong. I mean, I, that, I mean to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, I think that uh, capitalism is the worst economic system except for all the others. Huh? I mean, it has a lot of problems. But uh, it's, uh, the, in my view, still the best economic system that the humanity humanity has invented. But the problem is that over the last three decades, we have lived under a very particular form of capitalism, that is free market capitalism, which has uh, served us uh, very poorly. Hmm? You know, the point is that uh, there are many different ways to run capitalism. Hmm? I mean, it's not just uh, American-style capitalism that is uh, viable. I mean, there are many different forms, that are the you know, Japanese form, the Chinese form, hmm? the Swedish form, the German form, the French form. But uh, over the last 30 years, uh, we have been told that there's only one form of capitalism that works, and that is you know, Anglo-American style free market capitalism. Hmm? Over the last uh, three decades, uh, the, this uh, form of capitalism has uh, produced 
very disappointing results. And I'm not just uh, talking about the financial crisis that we are going through today. Even before the crisis, there, were, there was uh, plenty of evidence that things were not going well. Of course, uh, we've been told by all these uh, free market gurus uh, that uh, things are going swimmingly well with the advent of post-industrial knowledge economy, the demise of business cycles, the arrival of the Goldilocks economy, the great moderation, the taming of the inflation, the revolutions in the telecommunications and transportation technologies. So you are dulled into thinking that yes, that we are probably living in the best of all possible worlds, but actually even before the crisis, things were not going well. I mean, uh, let's uh, take the case of economic growth. You know, free market uh, advocates uh, tell us that free market capitalism is the best at creating wealth, even if it may create inequality. Yeah? Even many critics of uh, the free market capitalism agree with this assertion, although then they will say that, however, the high inequality that it produces is uh, morally unacceptable. Yeah? But the truth is that uh, free market capitalism has been actually very bad at generating growth. Huh? You know, in the 1960s and 70s, which uh, free market economists like to describe as a period of disaster that was created by excessive government regulation and punitive uh, taxation for the rich, during that period, the world economy was growing at about 3% per year in per capita terms. Huh? Over the last 30 years, the world economy grew at about half that rate. Yeah? So the, this assertion that uh, you know, the, this system may be harsh, it may create uh, uh, outcomes that some people might find uh, morally unacceptable, but it's the most efficient system in terms of uh, creating wealth, this is completely wrong. Yeah? The world economy has actually dramatically slowed down in, over the last uh, three decades of uh, free market capitalism. And, even that uh, low rate uh, would not have been achieved uh, except for countries like China and India, which while liberalized uh, to an extent, uh, is by no means you know, following this uh, free market uh, model. And regions where this uh, free market model has been most uh, the diligently applied, like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, have uh, seen basically very little growth. Huh? For another example, take, take the case of inflation. Free market uh, advocates uh, tell us that low inflation is a prerequisite for economic growth because it generates a stable environment that investors require. Well, I mean, the, the logic itself is uh, the, the not difficult to accept, but at least that, uh, in the rich countries, we have uh, achieved price stability in the last two decades but the overall economic stability has actually increased as we have had much more frequent financial crisis and much higher job insecurity during this period. So unless you define economic stability purely in terms of price stability, the world has become more unstable, not less unstable, through this anti-inflationary free market policies. And in many countries, the attempts to bring inflation down to a very low level has reduced investment and growth by cutting demands and making business loans overly expensive. Free market orthodoxy has uh, told the poor countries that they need free trade free market policies in order to develop their economies. It has said that uh, these are policies that all rich countries, with the possible exception of Japan, use in order to get where they are today, so how dare you know, Ecuador or you know, Guinea-Bissau think that uh, they can do otherwise. You know? However, as I argue in my new book and in greater detail in my previous book, Bad Samaritans, which uh, the, the incidentally was also endorsed by Larry, but the, the the previous uh, publisher uh, found it very amusing that I got a quote from Martin Ulf and Noam Chomsky. They decided uh, to put those two on the cover. 
As I show in these uh, books, uh, starting from 18th century Britain through to late 19th century US, Germany, and Sweden, down to late 20th century uh, France, Finland, Japan, and South Korea, virtually all of today's rich countries became rich through the use of trade protection, government subsidies, and regulation rather than free trade, free market policies. I could go on and on with uh, these kind of things, but uh, basically uh, in the book I destroyed uh, many of the kind of uh, key myths uh, in the free market uh, ideology and try to make you things in the, the way that uh, they really are. And in trying to explain these and other things, I try my best to dispel the widespread perception that economics is uh, too complicated for non-economists. And I uh, say often in my lectures, but also in the book, that 95% of economics is common sense deliberately made complicated, while even the remaining 5% can be explain in its uh, essence, if not in all technical details, if you really try. Hmm? So through this book, I want to equip my readers with uh, fundamental economic reasoning and some basic but misunderstood facts about capitalism so that they can better exercise what I call active economic citizenship and demand right courses of action from their policymakers political representatives, and business leaders. So I'll uh, leave you with that. Uh, finally, with uh, thanks uh, to Yunaf, my daughter, who helped with the uh, picture collection, and to Jingyu for his appearance in Thing 9, and help with uh, PowerPoint preparation. If you want to find out more about me, uh, they are there. Uh, you can email me if you want, uh, although I cannot promise uh, that I'll reply immediately. I eventually respond to all my emails. Could take uh, a few months, but uh, I do. Yeah? So that, uh, please uh, that, uh, take a look at the book and tell me what you think. Thank you. Um, so how has this happened? I mean, if, if we're getting it so spectacularly wrong, how has this happened? How, has, how, how have we come to believe all these things which are completely false? Well, I sometimes I liken it uh, to the movie Matrix. You know, the whole world is uh, that, uh, kind of presented to us uh, in this kind of uh, uh, manufactured way. And, you know, the best way to prove something is uh, to repeat it all the time. Mm -hmm. So that uh, when people hear from everywhere, many thousands of times, that Britain used to be uh, in the pits uh, in the 60s and 70s, Margaret Thatcher came along, saved the country, they don't even bother to check these statistics. Yeah? Yeah, but but you, you work at Cambridge, you've worked at the World Bank, I mean, there are smart people there. Mm -hmm. Surely they are able to spot what you've spotted, that you know, the trend rate of growth of Productivity in, in, in OECD countries has halved over the last 30 years, that unemployment levels are higher than they were, trend growth rates are lower. Um, what, why, why, why are these people still promulgating these false assertions? Yeah, well, unfortunately... Is, it, is, it, is that just a political thing? Oh, partly, yes. I mean, that, that, you know, put it this way, I mean, with apologies uh, to the Catholics, uh, the Vatican has a lot of smart people, yeah? mm. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, that, well, first of all, you have to know that, uh, that many academic economists today are not even interested in the real world. Actually, in the economics profession today, interest in the real world is that, uh, an indirect admission that you are not very good. Yeah? You know, if you are really smart, you do really abstract uh, mathematical modeling. Yeah? If you are a bit less good, you do econometrics, yeah? basically manipulating statistics. Yeah? If you are really down in the pits, uh, uh, you are interested in the real world. Yeah? So there's uh, that uh, strange academic culture 
But of course, uh, the more important explanation is that uh, when you say these uh, the uncomfortable things, uh, the people uh, refuse to listen to you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that uh, when some you know, free market guru says uh, great things about uh, how swimmingly things are going, they're all over the, the financial newspapers. When people say uncomfortable things, uh, they are just ignored. Okay. In a sense, this book reminds me a bit of um, Karl Polanyi's The Great Transformation, which he says that laissez-faire in the 19th century was a political construct. It wasn't, exactly, it, it yeah. wasn't a force of mm -hmm. nature. It wasn't this sort of natural phenomenon. Yeah. It was a politically dominated political economy yeah. system, and eventually it didn't work. It was, it was clear it didn't work. So from about 1850 to about 1950, mm. a whole bunch of reforms were made right, to, yeah. the, to the economic system. Mm. So you had sort of welfare states, and you had sort of graduated income tax, you had yeah. free education, exactly, yeah. uh, you know, the growth of trade unions. Yeah. I mean, are you saying that because this, uh, this system is palpably not working, that we need to rethink some economic policies. I mean, that we need to rethink whether capital controls are a good idea, that we need to rethink whether, oh, whether yeah. strong trade unions mm -hmm. are a good idea. So we need to, yeah. to roll back some of the things that yeah. have been done. Is that, what is that, is that is Yeah, actually, it, uh, you know, free market economies are fantastically bad at that, uh, knowing how to defend that actually capitalism. You know, I, I give uh, some examples in the book. I mean, uh, for example, in the late 19th century, most uh, free market economists, uh, including Adam Smith uh, himself, uh, were against uh, limited liability. Eh? And the biggest defender of uh, uh, limited liability among economists was actually Karl Marx, yeah? who said that uh, this is uh, the, the vehicle that's going to take capitalism to another plane. Yeah? But uh, the free market economists that, uh, really didn't understand that, uh, how yeah, important this was. So that, I mean, the fact that you are defending something actually doesn't mean that uh, you understand it the best, and probably that, that uh, very often the, the kind of uh, prescription that you give are actually against the interests uh, of the system. Yeah. yeah. But how do you see that? As, before I throw it open, there's one question about political agency, really. I mean, I can see why there are quite a lot of rich, powerful people who actually kind of want to turn a blind eye to some of mm -hmm. these defects mm -hmm. because they're the people, oh, yeah, they're the course, people yeah. who are doing rather yeah. well out of this yeah. system. You know, if you're the owner of a company, then it's not in your interest to have strong trade unions because mm -hmm. you get more of the proceeds of growth yourself. Yeah. I mean, how do you see, if the system is clearly not working properly and we've got higher unemployment, lower growth, and more inequality, how does, how does that change? Yeah, that's... Given, given, given the power of... Yeah, no, that, that's where my idea of uh, active economic citizenship comes in. Huh? Yeah. I mean, the, the people have to demand the changes, but then the problem is that the people have been kind of brainwashed in this uh, free market ideology that they think uh, everything that's happening has to happen. You know, I mean, that uh, we are often told that uh, the factories have to move and the, the jobs have to be destroyed and we have to abandon manufacturing because there's great technological revolution going on and so on. I mean, uh, that's uh, where I... That, uh, uh, bring in the example of a uh, washing machine against uh, the internet. Eh? You know, that, uh, basically the morale of uh, that chapter is that uh, technology, of course, uh, sets the boundary of uh, what is possible, mm. but technology doesn't determine where you are. Eh? Mm. You know, that, uh, for example, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the world economy was on every account much less globalized than the world economy around the turn of the 19th century, 20th century. Yeah. Why? Because the governments put restrictions on the, the movement of things. And I mean, when you think about it, the, 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 how was uh, the world economy run in the early 20th century? It was basically run on the basis of steamships and wire, not even wireless uh, telegraphy. Eh? But uh, the world economy was uh, much more globalized than what it was in the 1950s and 60s. This uh, shows that uh, it's not really technology, but politics that defines these things. But then, of course, that uh, people who want to defend the system want to tell you that it's all because of technology, it's all because of you know, China, it's all because of something that's uh, happening you know, beyond our control that, uh, that we have to you know, uh, sack yeah. you and we have to move jobs and uh, we have to make you work uh, 26 hours a day. You know? So isn't it, isn't it kind of, I will flare over, isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it somewhat depressing then that a crisis which started three years ago 
at the very heart mm. of the financial system and expose the you know, fallacy of quite a lot of free market economics has ended up with a policy prescription, which is all about cutting public spending. That's right. Yeah. No, no, I mean, uh, that's the yeah, uh, uh, success of uh, the defenders of uh, the system. Yeah? But, you know, I remain a pessimist in the short run. You know, I mean, yeah. how come yeah, the people who almost destroyed the world economy now are... Yeah, coming back and uh, lecturing us uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, you can't have your health care, you can't have your education because that, uh, we need yeah, to yeah. control public finance. So that, that makes me quite depressed, but uh, in, in the long run, I remain an optimist. You know, 200 years ago, people thought it was uh, quite all right to buy and sell people, yeah? slave, slave trade. Yeah? 100 years ago, uh, they put women in prison uh, for asking for vote. 50 years ago, all the founding fathers of uh, developing nations were hunted by the French and the British as terrorists. 20 years ago, Mrs. Thatcher said that uh, someone who thinks that uh, there'll be a majority black rule in South Africa lives in uh, cloud cuckoo land. Eh? But these things all have happened. Eh? So that, uh, I, I follow the, the Italian Marxist uh, Antonio Gramsci in this, uh, who said that we have to have pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. Yeah? We have to make these changes. Yeah? And then the first step uh, the, in that process is to know what is really going on. Yeah? I mean, you that, uh, remember the scene that uh, where Morpheus uh, that, uh, is uh, asking Neo whether he wants to take the red pill or the blue pill. Yeah? So this is uh, the red pill. Yeah? 